Nazir Ahmad is a digital economist from Nigeria who specializes in digital disruption. He penned the book, Dangers of Fake News, Nigeria at the Crossroads. His mission is to educate people on how to identify disinformation, how to correct it, and the consequences when it is allowed to fester. Ahmed is also the chief executive founder of the Educated Child Tutorial Center. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It is a honor to be with you right now. <laughs> so there is a page on our Canadian government website that discusses disinformation as Thank a you. threat to democracy. And before we dive into the fallout, let's dissect what it is. How All would right. you describe disinformation? As far as I'm concerned, actually, disinformation is something that's not being universally defined because there's always a conflict in understanding, in using the words interchangeably with disinformation and even misinformation sometimes. So, however, for the sake of our conversation, we can say, all right, fine. This information is simply a distortion of reality, a distortion of reality or a kind of a spreading fake news or creating news that are not there or rumors in order to score a political point. You know, is a, this is an information that is being spread to the public in order to achieve a particular end. Some is different from fake news. Same fake news actually might not be to achieve any particular goal. It could be a kind of an information gap between the sender and the receiver. So that one, in fact, most of the cases we see media houses apologizing for spreading information that they thought was true. So it was not deliberate in most cases. But for disinformation, actually, it has been spread to achieve a particular goal. And then we've even seen nations like fascist nations spreading disinformation using the propaganda tool. They are spreading those disinformation because they want to achieve a particular goal. Or it is they want to brainwash the public, or they want to hide a fact, or they want to paint a particular person as their enemy. So in most cases, it is deliberate and it has a motive behind it. Yeah, and we're seeing that here in North America. Many of our circles have drank this poison and have gone down this alternate universe of disinformation. Right. Is there right. a way to get them back? What do you say? <laughs> See, if we really get people back, we want to put in a kind of firewall between disinformation and the people out there. Actually, there are a lot of things we have to do. But importantly, we have to understand who is the principal behind this information that we have in the public, who created it. And then to what end, what do they want to achieve? You see, in places like Rwanda, you know, we've seen this genocide in 93 with the Kigali Airthorn. They owned the radio station. They owned the radio station. And those that owned the radio station were able to engineer, socially engineer the public by spreading deliberate propaganda and even disinformation just to cause conflict between the tribes living in Rwanda. And after giving them the information on the radio, he also armed them with a machete so that they could kill their brothers. And that was one of the, you know, largest suicide that humanity has ever seen in Africa, conducted by African people on their own, on their own people. So, but when we started looking at the problem, then we also look at the solutions that people that have gone through this problem are facing, even though there's a difference between the solution they had and what we are having today because of yeah. the unanimous power of the internet and social medias. Information now travels faster than ever before in the history of humanity. So, all right, well, look at Finland. What is Finland doing as far as fighting fake news and disinformation is concerned? And it turns out that Finland has been remarkably well investing in the education of their people. So one most important tool is education and orientation. I graduated from economics, but I used to tell people that economics should not be about all the numbers. You should look at the social ramifications, social economic ramifications of whatever you're doing on the lives of people, not just the numbers, not just the business. You're trying to make life better. You're trying to improve quality of life. And then you cannot do that without investment in education. Because mm -hmm. if people are well-educated, they understand, okay, somebody that is spreading this kind of information has an agenda in his mind. 
does that will that agenda be good for us or it is going to be against us okay how are we going to find out that's how? an interesting point if i might inter interject because in north america in both the us and canada in the conservative states and provinces yeah. We are seeing yeah. education being weaponized. We are seeing them trying to dumb down the education, like erase some of the history and do that. So this is interesting. Yeah, that's true. That's true, actually. Because, you know, when people don't know who they are, where they come from, they will not understand where they are going because they don't have a past. They don't have anything that is tracing them to the past, their ancestors, or whatever it is that the, 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 the struggle was. So. It is a particular set of people that give us the Nigeria that we have today. And then without their struggles, we will not have what we have today, even in Canada, I'm sure, because there is a kind of law in the human race. Some people have to struggle for it. Then the next generation will come and build on that. Yeah, even in academics, you can talk of all the Aristotles, the writings, the Plato, everything. They give us these philosophies so that we can think and build on that. So as far as education is concerned, you know, only people that don't want their, their subjects to understand the criminality of their administrations tend to weaponize education. And we're also having that problem somewhere around here because education has been deliberately underfunded. If you are following the news in Nigeria in the last three, two months, you've been seeing that all right. They are on strike because the universities are shutting down because they are protesting the kind of our facilities to educate children and all, they are all welfare as well. So the average budget of education in Nigeria, I think, is even around probably maybe 12 to 18 percent of the annual budget that we have, which is grossly mm -hmm. below what the UNESCO is uh, suggesting of 26 percent at least. So education is very important. We have to orientate people and even give them tools and technologies. So apart from that, if you are probably maybe consuming this information online, yeah, you may want to check the dates the information was published. A lot of people seeing all these fishy headlines, you know, troubling headlines, don't care about the author, they don't care about the date, they don't care about the time, they just go in and then get what they want that, that justify their own belief or bias, then they start disseminating it. So mm -hmm. what I usually do is, number one, I have to have a good relationship with the media public, with the media firms that I'm consuming my news from. This time, even if you have to pay to get good information, I think it's worth it because there are a lot of irrelevant information outside. And then what people just want is to get your attention. You click on that blog so they make money from the data you're spending on your site. So it's not about the news anymore. Just like we're talking about Elon, the verification comes with money. Right now, it's not about you. It's, it's, it's not about the news they're telling you. It's about your own data. They want to consume yeah. something from your data and monetize it. So that is it. So you want to check the date. There are information that you even have to go to some sites to go and verify. We call it fact check. Fact check. So you can go there and verify, oh, did this event happen? Because most of the information are either bringing back a past. They tell you, ah, someone did this and that in the past. Or they're trying to kind of paint the present with their own brush that suits their interest or they tell you something is going to happen. Look at the coronavirus pandemic. There was a serious misinformation going out worldwide. Oh, Bill Gates created this vaccine. He want to wipe out the world population. Oh, he did that, oh, he did that. A lot of fake information were going out. But if you look at the date, some informations were even released even before the pandemic of the coronavirus. So somebody just brought it back so that he can monetize or score a particular goal. So the most important thing, the underlying rule, fighting misinformation or any disinformation in the public is uh, education. Yes. And then you can come back to law. There has to be a law. There has to be a penalty for somebody that is, you know, caught spreading disinformation in the society. It could be a fine. It could be a community service. But there has, somebody should not just deliberately spread misinformation and get free. It should be a crime. Voting is important because who you put in the decision-making process impacts... Yeah all the way yeah. down the line. A lot of this disinformation is planted by foreign governments and yeah. whose goal is to topple and disrupt, which we have been seeing. So is this happening where you are as well? Well, right now, talking about international politics actually is something that I really pick interesting. Understanding international politics actually is just like climbing on a mountain. The further you go, the more difficult it becomes. And then it is only when you get to the top that you see, oh, who is the real player behind the game? 
So that is just it. So, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, I didn't think uh, here I have serious interest as far as uh, international politics or interference is concerned because I've seen what has happened in the past, especially in our uh, countries like Middle East, seen how uh, they've topped our uh, regimes in Middle East. We've seen how it happened in, uh, in, uh, in countries like Venezuela. And then we've also seen that happen somewhere in around East Africa here. So yes. these are things that we know are going on, but uh, there are a lot of conspiracy theories around it. So you, you can't even check which one is the fact or, or which one is not, because number one, I don't have the resources actually to know such kind of privileged information. So even though we have, uh, I think uh, this media facility controlled by people that leak this information, it said, leaks. Controlled by, yeah, which leaks, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. They have privileged information as far as, uh, you know, espionage cooperation is concerned, probably maybe international interference and politics, they have all this information, but sometimes I don't believe it. That, that's true. I don't believe it. It's an open source information, but uh, I'm only interest, interested in understanding how that person came about that information and why is he making it public? Why? Yeah. Why is he making it public? Yeah. So, you so always kind of have to check the source, don't you? I usually, yeah, 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 if yeah, only exactly. one source has published it and it's not one of the, the larger newspaper yeah. or media outlets, if it's just one site that I might not recognize that has put the information out, yeah. I will wait. I will kind of vet it and I'll look to see if anybody else is talking about it. And if nobody is, then it's kind of, it, it's clickbait or it's something that seems suspicious. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't believe yeah, yeah. it. It's a very complex phenomenon, actually. It there is. A lot of players, different strategies, different uh, payoffs, and different uh, beliefs and ideologies in it. So, and but, and uh, governments uh, are having a hard time managing it. It's kind of a losing have, battle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then the, the relationship between my government here yeah, is with the international world, uh, especially in Europe or, or, or America is concerned is being uh, a kind of uh, aid support, you know, they, they are more interested in getting aid from the developed countries so that we can come here and, uh, you know, provide basic infrastructures. Also, so we don't really have a, a much say or influence as far as like, international politics is concerned compared to countries like probably the US or the UK where what they see or what they believe in or what they do hold he waits in the United Nations or other important policies in the world. So I think that was one of the reasons why actually I find it very difficult to get, you know, into international yeah. international politics right now why yeah. at least i know it's a kind of globalizations and then all that of things i think every country gets banned to uh, seek certain areas like even don't have access and i'm sure the americans don't have access to some exactly. areas and it's frustrating yeah. it's very frustrating exactly exactly if you are actually in this country, I think, uh, and then you really want to get something for your future, if you want something, you want to become somebody or you want to pursue your goal, I think right now you have to leave criticism aside of uh, what kind of country is it. And then even yeah. start asking, what can you do for your people? I mean, what can you do for your government? Since your government is not looking after you and then nobody is looking after you, what can you do for them? It's, 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 you know, in every relationship, it's either you give or take, or you both give and take something back, probably in making a transaction on a buy, probably a smartphone, I pay the money and he gives me back, or I give him without getting anything back, I can help somebody, or somebody gives me something without getting anything back, or we do trade. I started asking, okay, what is it can I do for my people? What can I do? And that was one of the reasons why I started the Education Child Center back then, even before I got an admission into a university where I completed my PSC, I was passionate about the people. Actually, I went around their schools and I discovered that, oh yeah, their teachers are trying, but these children needed some time to also understand what it is they have been taught. And I observed some of the things they are not taught. I think I, I found a way, I started up the center in my home and I started giving them this education. However, today, after seven years, I think the story is different. If, mm -hmm. Even while I was in school, at times when I go back home for holiday, one or two of the students refused to stop coming. They still come and I still teach them free of charge. Actually, I do that free of charge because I've run the end. Sometimes I even give them money to motivate them so that they can come back and you know understand. So the story has changed today. The education that we've been teaching these three kids in the school should not be just basic algebra or basic English or a kind of integrated science. A lot of things is going on out there, you know, as far as like AI is concerned, you know, as far as machine learning is concerned, and you know, all this kind of, you know bioinformation, nanotechnology, robotics, everything has, is changing the world. And this is what, what is changing the world right now. 
So I think this student right in school, you will see what is happening in developed countries where they get familiar with these terminologies and tools able to start developing, you know, uh, robotics. So we want to see if we can tell them the story, but there's a problem. The problem here is understanding from the parents. We have this culture that is impeding some of our progress and then the children have, some of the youth actually have chosen easy money over hard yeah. work. So that's why you can see, and the idea is having a reputation of, you know, getting involved in cyber crime, which, which unfortunately shouldn't have been so because we have one of the most talented youths in the end. We've created a lot of things. And Nigerians have been part of successful, you know, technologies and innovations, be it in fintech, health, aviation, or you name it. If we can fight through and see, so we will be able to achieve something. So at that particular time, I wrote Gender of Fake News while I was in my final year doing studying for my BS. It was very mm -hmm. difficult for me to write because I was the president of my association, the Nigerian Economic Student Association. I was the president too at that particular time. And then I was doing my final year project and I also had to write a book. So it was very difficult, but I believe in multitasking some way. I, I, I managed to write the schedule and I published the book. So when writing the book, actually, I came about a lot of questions and I didn't know who I wanted to ask. And then I finally found you on Twitter and I said, oh yeah, I think, this uh, somebody that has written a lot of books. You have your personal blogs, and then I see the team of the books you write and the works you do. I also discovered that you also love rugby, which is nice. I can see your helmet in your back. So it's nice, actually. It's good to have a nice hobby, actually. So I said, all right, finally, let me see how I can talk to you about it. Because my challenge, actually, is not what to write. Because... I've uh, been gifted with this ability to accept. Just even what we just talked about is a great thing for you to write because you have a unique perspective. This is why I, right. I wanted to talk to you is because of your exactly. global perspective on this story. Because to me, where I sit, this is the number one issue worldwide is this global place we're in right now. We're seeing media sources get bought out conglomerates are trying to monopolize the media so you've yeah. got on the one hand you've got f the fox umbrella and uh, now with musk buying twitter which is maybe not the largest platform in social media but it is everybody's news source Exactly. To control the narrative almost, even though we are the product. Yeah. Without us, there is no product <laughs> on all of these social platforms. That's true. But it's also a way to control the narrative. And if we're going back to fascism and political okay. narratives, That's education, right. it's a dangerous thing when technically we really want individual ownership of different platforms not the same person to own all of them what are your thoughts on that yeah so, you know that's true i'm looking at this from two perspectives you see and i'll explain one economically and i'll try to explain the other politically what i'm looking at it from the perspective i'm looking at it right now is monopolizing the media you know, a particular group of people come together with their own ideology they believe in, and then they try to kind of monopolize the source of information. And these are one of the foundations of a fascist society, because whosoever controls the media controls the mind of the people. Yeah. Actually, you regulate what they see, you get to tell them what they watch, you get to, you know, make them believe in what they do. This, this is what happened in the past, actually. So history might likely repeat itself. Because these people are also having dominance over the media. They are not only having dominance over the media, they also have a dominance in the tech and the automobile industries. Yes. That is one thing I want us to understand. Because it's just like an octopus with different nozzles, you know, pointing it at different institutions of the society. So, which is very bad, even for a commodity. If you take an example of an essential commodity and you say it is only one player that sells and determines the price in the market, then he's likely going to extort the people because he has power over the price. 
is going to charge a monopoly price and there's not going to be any competition in the society. If somebody is trying to bring in something better than what he has before, probably through his research or something, he can easily buy him off so that he doesn't have a competition and suppress or deliberately submerge that research or whatever project it is. So that is just it. And if you're looking at it from the political angle, you can see, okay, all right, fine. Even if we're not getting close to fascists, probably we'll be getting close to where few, few set of people are kind of rulers and controllers. They determine whatever we see and whatever we watch. So information is very, very essential. In fact, it's the most essential commodity in this 21st century. So I actually get suspicious of people that are trying to monopolize information domains. I mm -hmm. think uh, such people should actually be watched and then if there's anything that we can do to a kind of regulate it, that would be fine. Because don't forget, they are not only providing information, but at the back end, they also have access to unlimited amount of data. It's very important. You have to talk about this data and then he uses this data to a kind of model and predict human behavior. And that's why you see even the ads that we are seeing whenever we are browsing online is a targeted ad. It's, it's as if somebody has a, a small window in your soul and then it's trying to tell you, oh, I knew you want this and therefore I'm giving you this advert. Therefore, you just have to buy it now. So they are using these data they are collecting and telling exactly what it is that we want. So I even start worrying if the choices I make online are my own choices or there's an algorithm that's making me believe in these choices and I just endorse it. And they are doing that with the power of the data they have. And then some of the time, this data easily find their way in places where they, they shouldn't. We've seen the Cambridge Analytica problem, where they use data to determine Brexit policies and a lot of things, the elections, they were hacked. We've seen all these data going on. And we know what they can do with data in today's world. So actually, that is a problem. We have to talk about the pricing and the monopoly power. And then we also talk about the issue of privacy. Privacy is very important. And what you do with people's data. There's this application that I'm using on my phone to track my productivity. I think it's called App Usage. It's, it gives me the number, the, the exact hour and minutes that I spent on each application on my smartphone. So the year I came to Icon Cluster, where I spend most of my time, and if it's worth it, or if it's not worth it, then let me adjust. Three, four days ago, I updated the application. I saw a future that enables me to export this data because I've accumulated them. And then I want to run and see the behavior of the data in a Pandas machine learning tool. So to my surprise, they said that I have to pay $10 for the data. You see, it is my data. They gave me the yeah. tool to extract the data. And now they will not even let me have it. <laughs> so can you imagine? They will not even let me have it. I have to pay for my data. And then without me, like you said, we are the product, they will not be the application. Despite the fact that we are the product, simultaneously, we are also the commodity. We are, yeah. Right oh, about the monopolies in Canada, we have a pretty big country, but we literally have three major conglomerates that own everything. They own our cable, they own our cell service, they own the internet. Everybody here purchases our, our services from one of these three companies. Now they have all these little branch companies too, but they're still a division of those major companies and now they are talking about two of those conglomerates want to marry each other and we're seeing that with a lot of the major media newspapers and whatnot like Sinclair has bought out most of the American media uh, newspapers those are things that we'll, we won't solve in this little broadcast but it's something that we've got to keep our eye on and I'm so Thank glad you, to get your perspective. Thank you.